Dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Doug Scriver, Chair, the University of Denver Board of Trustees. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Scrivener, and I am the Chair of the University of Denver's Board of Trustees. On behalf of the University, its Board of Trustees, and Chancellor Rebecca Chopp, and the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, I welcome you to this special gathering of DU alumni and friends. In just a few minutes, we will hear an engaging conversation on historic events which are unfolding as we speak with one of the key players in those events who just happens to be a Corbell alum. But first, let me take you back to Denver for a moment. Let me take you back to Denver for just a moment. This is such an exciting time for DU. Our new chancellor, Rebecca Chop, was formally installed just a few weeks ago. She launched a strategic planning process last September, which engaged more than 2,500 people, both within and outside the DU community, to craft a vision for moving the university forward. A draft document called DU Impact 2025 presents the results of that work to date and was issued recently. I invite you to read it and offer your feedback. You can find DU Impact 2025 on the DU website at imaginedu at du.edu. This is also an exciting time for the Joseph Corbell School. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated a construction milestone for the school's new Anna and John J. C. International Relations Complex. We witnessed the placing of a beautiful spire, which you can see in the photograph over there, atop the building's tower, only increasing our anticipation of the completion next February of this state-of-the-art facility, which will allow us to expand Corbell's exciting programs. Leading the way for Corbell is the dean of the school, Ambassador Christopher Hill. Dean Hill came to the Corbell School in 2010 after an extraordinary career in the Foreign Service. After serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Cameroon, he moved on to the State Department where he served for 33 years. He was the U.S. Ambassador to four countries. He was the first U.S. Ambassador to Macedonia. He was Ambassador to Poland. He was ambassador to South Korea and led the U.S. negotiating team that sought to address the issues of North Korea's nuclear weapons. And in 2009 and 2010, he was ambassador to Iraq during the very challenging national elections there. Dean Hill also served as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. In the 1990s, he was a senior member of the negotiating team that secured the Dayton Peace Accords, ending the Bosnian War and was a special envoy to Kosovo, working to end that war as well. He's written about these remarkable experiences in his book, Outpost, Life on the Frontiers of American Diplomacy, available at Amazon and elsewhere. <laughs> in his five years of leadership at Corbell, he has raised the profile of the school on the global stage, broadened the curriculum for our students, expanded the faculty, and grown the research program. Please join me in welcoming the Dean of the Joseph Corbell School, Ambassador Christopher Hill. Thank you very much, Doug. And let me say what a pleasure it is uh, to be here at the Waldorf Astoria. I spent many of my late September and early October days uh, um, coming to this hotel and waiting at the elevators and uh, otherwise having an amazing set of meetings. So uh, there is none more so than the one we're about to have today, but uh, it's great to be back here. I have a few introductions I'd like to do before I get to our, to our distinguished guest. And first I'd like to introduce members of the Iranian delegation, Ambassador Koshru, uh, Director General uh, Qasem uh, Sajadpour, Director General Masood uh, Islami, uh, Director General Al Habib, and Ambassador Degani. Uh, for you, Director Generals, you guys do all the work. I know how foreign ministries operate. As Director Generals, the good news never comes to them. It always goes to you know people hire the Director Generals. They always get the bad news. So uh, a lot of respect for for what you all do.
Now we have a number of people from, um, from uh, the University of Denver. You have met Doug Scrivener, our distinguished chair of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Doug has uh, uh, taken over in this uh, past, uh, past year and seen already a lot of changes at the University of, University of Denver, including bringing along a, uh, a new chancellor who has kind of taken the campus by storm. Uh, we are in a sort of state of siege every day because every single day there is some new strategic plan that is being circulated and we are working our tails off trying to uh, keep up with our new chancellor, Rebecca Chop. And if you have not had a chance to be at the University of Denver uh, lately, you ought to see the place. It is a whirlwind. We have as well some, um, some great uh, members of the Board of Trustees. Uh, uh, Fred Waldick is here. Uh, Fred and Nancy, thank you for all your help in putting together this, uh, this day. We also have Margot Gilbert Frank, who's here with her husband, Alan Frank, and also their daughter, uh, Lisa. Uh, Trig Marin, who was uh, Doug's predecessor as chairman of the Board of, uh, of uh, trustees, you know, that is a tough job being chairman of the board of trustees and uh, usually they don't last very long, sort of like second lieutenants in World War I or something, but uh, uh, Trigg managed to stick it out for uh, many years and really took this school to a, to a new orbit. And we thank you for all your service, uh, Trigg, and of course his, his uh, wife Vicki. And when you look at the Marin Art Gallery in, um, at the university, it's not so much Trigg's gallery, with all due respect to Trigg's artistic tastes, it is really very much Vicky's gallery. And uh, we also have some other uh, people here, uh, Armin uh, Afashi, who is our new Vice Chancellor of Advancement. Yes, he is an Iranian uh, uh, American. We just thought it's very important at the University of Denver to have an Iranian American uh, to run our fundraising. I hope you agree. <laughs> so I'm not even sure what I mean by that comment, but uh, we're going to leave it right there. You have met uh, some of our students. These are nine, uh, nine of our, our students, some of our very, very best, and uh, they've come all the way out from Colorado. We understood you could only travel about 25 miles from the, from the Iranian mission in New York, so the closest you could have gotten to Denver was somewhere in New Jersey, so we thought maybe we'd, uh, we'd do it here instead. Uh, I'd also like to meet Ali or, or mention Alicia uh, Kirkaby, who did such a fabulous job of uh, putting this all together. Uh, there are other people as well who's, who've, who've worked uh, uh, back in Denver, I'd also like to mention Jennifer Thompson as well. So we've had uh, quite a group putting this together, and all because we are absolutely thrilled. We are greatly honored to have the Honorable Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, Mohammad Javed Zarif, with us today. Um, Minister Zarif is very much Western educated. Uh, as they say, but Western educated in a somewhat different sense. He had his undergraduate at San Francisco State. He got his master's from us in 1984 and his PhD in 1988. I know that uh, Robin Wright took some time to dig out that PhD. I think she actually read it, which might have been the first time since 1988 that anyone had actually read it. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, such is the life of investigative journalists. But. Uh, uh, we are so honored that uh, you are our graduate. Your PhD was self-defense in international law and policy. Maybe we can have a little discussion about that. Mr. Minister, you have done so much uh, for in, in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. I, I don't know why, but I kind of like career foreign service people. It's just a little prejudice I have. And um, Mr. Minister, I can see you've done just about every job your country has asked uh, you to do. You've been the ambassador to, uh, to the United Nations from 02 to 07. You're chairman of the uh, legal committee of the 47th United Nations General Assembly. You've been chairman of the UNESCO Cultural Commission. You've been member of the group of eminent lawyers to amend the charter of the Organization of Islamic Conference. You've been vice president of the UN General Assembly, chairman of the UN Disarmament Commission, chairman of the political committee of the 12th Non-Aligned Movement Summit in Durban. You've also taught for some two decades at the university 
uh, level, meaning you've been, um, you know, in, uh, at that kind of level, it's not just you asking the questions, the students ask you questions. So uh, we're going to do a little of that today as well. And you've been a member of the academic staff of the Faculty of Law and Political Science of the University of Tehran. Mr. Minister, it is a great honor and a great privilege to have you here. And thank you so much for coming back to some of the members of your, uh, your alma mater. Uh, many of these people are from the University of Denver, but they live in this area of New York. They, it's very sad. Many of them want to go back to Colorado, but what can they do? Uh, someone has to live in New York. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And I'm going to sit down. We're going to start to have a little conversation. So Mr. Minister, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, for the last few months, once the agreement was announced. We've had some discussions in the United States about it. Generally, they've been civil, but the important thing is after lengthy, lengthy discussions, every newspaper, et cetera, et cetera, we finally agreed to this, uh, to this uh, uh, what we call the nuclear deal, uh, without using the jargon that you and Secretary Kerry have used. But uh, I wonder if you can tell me, how, how's it all going in Tehran? Is everyone on board for this thing? Well, it's been not happening. Let me first of all uh, begin by thanking all of you for uh, organizing this. It's been a great honor to be back uh, at what, what I used to call GSIS, and now you call Joseph Corbell School. Uh, although, uh, courtesy of State Department, I cannot come to uh, Denver, so thank you for coming to New York. Good, good to see you all here, and thank you, Ambassador Hill, for arranging this, for organizing this, and I also th wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, my own professors at the EU, uh, Professor Rowe, uh, Professor Nanda, Professor Shepard, and, and everybody else. And these three were my thesis supervisors. So I wanted to thank them. I know Tom Rowe played a, an important role in, in organizing this, and sure. I wanted to make sure that I thank him for, for his role. Um, it's interesting that in spite of all our differences, we are very much alike. The only two members of, of uh, Iran and 5 plus 1 who had to go through a domestic process to start implementing uh, the, what you call the nuclear agreement and what we call the joint comprehensive program of action, because we didn't want to call it an agreement that would require ratification. Uh, so that's, that's why the name is so long. <laughs> Otherwise, we could have called it nuclear agreement. Uh, there's a reason for everything, uh, I guess, in, in, in diplomacy. Um, so you had to go through a process uh, which, uh, at the end of the day, decided not to vote on it, which, which was good. I mean, because had they voted on it, it would have required a presidential veto. Uh, in our case, we neither have that filibuster provision nor a veto. So the parliament can, in fact, prevent us from implementing it. And there is a lot of misgiving in Iran about, about this process. Uh, because uh, the way they, uh, many Iranians look at it is that we had a civilian nuclear program and we were wrongly and unjustly subjected to uh, 10 years of uh, pressure and eight years, uh, six years of sanctions. So they thought we required, I mean, what, what was necessary was to, for, for the rest of the world to apologize to Iran and we would uh, call it quits and move forward. So. Uh, accepting to some restrictions over our nuclear program was something that was not uh, seen as necessary by, by many Iranians, uh, most. But, but they all wanted to end this episode uh, because whether we liked it or not, there, was, there were six or seven Security Council resolutions that prevented uh, serious interaction between Iran and the rest of the world. Uh, and we wanted to put that to an end, particularly there were a number of uh, U.S. extraterritorial measures which prevented us from dealing with the rest of the world, even uh, although it was not officially banned, but even to buy medicine, uh, we needed to carry cash. 
because although it was legal, no bank was prepared to uh, allow transfer of Iranian funds. And they had every reason not to do it because uh, <clears throat> some banks were fined billions of dollars for doing that. Paribas was fined $8.9 billion for doing business with Iran. HSBC was, uh, was fined billions of dollars for doing business with Iran. So the Treasury Department pretty much scared everybody. It's not just the IRS that can, can scare people. Treasury can also scare people, and everybody was pretty much scared. Uh, and combined with Justice Department, basically nobody wanted to do business with Iran uh, for the fear of, of U.S. retribution. So we wanted to end this, and uh, there, there were negotiations uh, two years uh, in, the, in the latest episode. And there were in Iran, and continue to be in Iran, people who are emotionally, uh, I mean, very much emotionally opposed to it. And uh, they have uh, some uh, real reasons for, for opposing it. So there has been a real debate in Iran. We, have, we, we are also in an election year. We have two important elections coming up uh, in, in March. So there was another reason to play politics with this. I mean, there was a serious reason, and there was a political so reason. So you have politics too? Uh, well, it would, be, it, would, it would come as news to you, but we do. Uh, I mean, the, people outside the United States also have politics. Uh, and and the, you, you raised, Ambassador Hill, a very pertinent question. Bec because uh, when you negotiate with uh, American officials, they're not used to others also having public opinions, uh, sensitivities, politics, elections, need to address concerns of the people. Uh, so we do have politics, and, and this is a very politically charged uh, debate because some people have invested heavily politically uh, into seeing this deal not succeed, as people here had invested heavily into uh, rejecting this deal. So we have a debate. The debate has now reached its conclusion in, in our parliament. There was a special commission formed uh, to review this deal. Uh, the commission had a whole range of misgivings about the deal, and it produced its report. Uh, yesterday, uh, the parliament failed to pass a priority status for the bill authorizing Iran, uh, the government, to implement the, uh, the deal. We believe, legally, we don't need to ratify this deal in, in our parliament because it's an it's, it's a program of action to deal with certain Security Council resolutions. It's not an international agreement. So whatever Senator Cotton wants to say, this is not a deal that requires either congressional ratification in the United States nor a parliamentary ratification in Iran. And that is why we decided to go for uh, informing the parliament, as was required by a legislation. Just, just like the United States, the Corker Bill in in the Senate, which required the, the administration to report to, to Congress because the administration otherwise would not have been required to report. We have the same uh, legislation that was adopted in our parliament that required us to report, we reported. Now, the parliament, just like your Congress, can prevent us from implementing this deal. So if they adopt the legislation preventing us from implementing this deal, it would be similar to uh, your Congress disapproving uh, the agreement and preventing the United States from removing the sanctions. Uh, the parliament, uh, thankfully, is not going to do that. Uh, the, the legislation authorizing us to, uh, to implement the agreement, uh, the speaker of the parliament submitted that legislation requesting a type of priority to be approved so that legislation will not have to go back to commission. Uh, that did not receive the two-thirds majority that was required. So the legislation went back to commission. Uh, I heard that the commission procedure has finalized, I hope today, so it will go back to the floor of our parliament. There is an impeachment procedure tomorrow against one of my colleagues in the cabinet in the parliament. So tomorrow is not the best day for this to go to the parliament. Uh, they will wait until next week uh, to, to see if we can have it approved uh, on the floor of our parliament. And that would put us in a position 
uh, to be beyond that domestic state. So you had a procedure in the United States. Uh, we have our own procedure in Iran, and I hope that by, by this time next week, uh, we would have uh, finished that procedure. You know, we were going to offer you I told you that I'll be long-winded, so that, that was the first example you got. We were going to offer you some technical assistance in your parliament, but it seems that you're well ahead of us. <laughs> on that. But I'm glad they're not going to vote it back into the committee. <laughs> no, the, they, voted, they, they did vote it back into the committee, but the committee, I, I think, it's a different committee. It's the, that was a special committee that was set up for that, and it was not representative of the general membership of, the, of, of, of our parliament. The general membership of our parliament is more or less in favor of this deal. But, but the, the membership of that commission uh, was, was somehow formed that was, was composed of the people who were eight to seven against the deal. So eight to seven voted uh, in favor of a report that was not very uh, complimentary about the deal. <laughs> But when it went back, it went back to the regular National Security Commission, I see. which represents the general membership of the parliament, and that commission adopted the legislation uh, allowing us to implement this. So as a diplomat, have you ever been in a uh, negotiation like that before? But not really. I mean, I, I was a part of the Iran-Iraq negotiations to end the war. Uh, I've been involved in, in uh, the negotiations to end the civil war in Afghanistan and install a new government, the bond negotiations, yeah. uh, and uh, this one. The, these are the three mo most important negotiations I've been involved in. And I was involved in the negotiations in the early 2000s, before right. our last president came to office, uh, on, on the same issue. And this has been probably the most intense negotiations that I've ever been uh, involved in. Uh, we've made, we broke some records. Uh, longest uh, presence of, of a US Secretary of State outside the United States since, I guess, Versailles. Uh, and uh, the longest one-shot session between uh, Secretary of State and another foreign minister. We had a nine-hour continuous meeting from six, um, nine in the evening till six in the following morning without a break. Uh, so I, I have to uh, admire Secretary Kerry's uh, stamina for staying up all that through that meeting. Uh, Did you feel guilty when he fell off his bicycle? Well, I wasn't around when he fell off his bicycle. <laughs> actually, actually I, 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 I think I gave him the headache that required him to go and ride the bike to get, get rid of that headache. So, uh, no, it was, it was the day after that meeting. I actually had problems with my knee when John and I met uh, in, in uh, Geneva. Uh, I was basically walking uh, in, a, in a kind of awkward way, uh, and he was healthy and all. Uh, so we had a long meeting, and the following day he goes out and uh, breaks his whatever. Yeah. So when, was there a point at which you thought we're going to get a deal or did that point come when you got a deal? Well, I mean, we had, we, in the course of the last two years, we basically had three deals. One was the temporary deal, the interim agreement, which we reached in Geneva after almost 100 days uh, after I was sworn in, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I was confirmed by our parliament as, as foreign minister. A uh, hundred days after that, we had the first agreement, uh, and that was the JPOA, without the C, Joint Program of Action. Uh, so you see, we, we didn't find any better wording, so we just added the C, Joint Comprehensive Program of Action was the final deal. To make it easier for us to understand? Yeah, know, I, mean, uh, I mean, we, we get paid to confuse people. I guess, <laughs> I guess that's, that's a part of our, our salary as diplomats. Uh, so what, what we did was, we had a deal that was supposed to last for six months. And in that six months, every, everything was supposed to be at standstill. You wouldn't add the sanctions. We wouldn't uh, increase our uh, uh, enrichment program. And we would negotiate a permanent deal. That ended up to take uh, almost 18 months. So we had to extend uh, the time limit three times. Uh, in, in April, we reached a framework 
uh, understanding. So that was the second uh, agreement that we reached, and the, and the third one was the Vienna deal. Uh, there were many moments where we thought that we would not achieve a deal. There were moments before uh, the Geneva Agreement where uh, some of your allies uh, and you know um, who uh, went out and made very negative derogatory comments about the negotiations between Iran and the United States. But not in English. Not in English. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then there were moments afterwards that uh, we thought either 5 plus 1, uh, that is the permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany, did not have the consensus within them for a deal, or times that we thought that the demands from us were excessive, and I believe yeah. there were times that, your, the, the, that the American delegation believed that the demands from our side were excessive. So we all had our uh, moments of despair, uh, but there were, I mean, I, I don't think that we could reach the moment where we, we thought that we had a deal before 3 o'clock or 12 o'clock midnight of the night before we announced the deal. Uh, so it was, it was a lot of ups and downs, a lot of bumps in the, uh, on the road. We knew that everybody was interested in getting a deal, but we knew that there were some areas where we needed to iron out the differences that required us to, to move forward. What was important, and I think what made the difference, and, and I, I say that as a student of international law and a student of international relations. Over the past maybe seven, eight decades, we have not been able to resolve many disputes through diplomacy. Maybe, if, I mean, if you even tried, you wouldn't be able to finish all your fingers <laughs> to, to count them. Uh, or even one hand. Yeah, yeah, we see. always had to go to a war before we ended up resolving a problem. That is, we exhausted all the wrong options before we went for the right option, and that is diplomacy. Right. This time, we also did, I mean, we didn't want to disappoint people about uh, the way we, 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 we work, so we exhausted all the wrong options except for war. Yeah. And then we went for diplomacy. And I think what made this work, and I think it will be important for our future work, is that we were able at some point in these negotiations to define the problem in a non-zero-sum way. That is, we defined the problem so that our gain was not necessarily the loss for the United States and your gain was not necessarily our loss. When we were able to do that, we were able to move forward. I believe right now, for the implementation of this agreement, we need to also look at this from a different paradigm. We're not used to that paradigm. We always consider the gain of the other side as our loss. I mean, always a yeah, zero sum zero approach. Sum, yeah. We now need to implement this agreement based on this approach or paradigm that we can all win together or lose together. There is no middle ground. We cannot win at the expense of the other. I think the same applies to Syria, the same applies to Yemen, the same applies to Iraq. Unless we change our paradigm, we will not be able to resolve these problems. And this example shows that however idealistic this paradigm change may look to some people, we did try it and we did succeed. So it's not bad to be idealistic once in every while and think of different ways, because the other ways have not produced much positive outcome. Yeah. I mean, realism or real politic was supposed to prevent war, but didn't. Yeah. I mean, at least didn't prevent uh, situations that were as miserable as war. Sometimes in a negotiation, you go through these really tough negotiations, nerves are a little frayed, and at a certain point you're looking for some gesture from a side to sort of uh, maybe a confidence building measure, something. So I'm, I'm gonna ask, and it, you know, if you don't wanna comment, that's fine, but was there a discussion of these four Americans who are in your country now? 
or was that sort of outside the foreign ministry's purview and, and therefore it couldn't be in this negotiation? Uh, I, I wanted to say something a bit less uh, serious and that is uh, Fanon says violence is a cleansing force. So for, for, for the people, for the colonized or dehumanized, if you see, if you read The Wretched of the Earth, uh, they use violence to cleanse their soul. In the negotiations, the cleansing force is shouting. When, when nothing can be done, you just shout, you just vent out uh, your frustration through shouting, and I believe Secretary Kerry and I did a bit of that. So that was very useful. Uh, but but yeah. confidence building measures did uh, enter into our uh, discussion. Uh, and the case of uh, the four Iranian Americans have been discussed. We are continuing to discuss that. Obviously, that's not the only humanitarian yeah. case that is pending. Uh, a lot of people uh, have been jailed uh, in the United States and outside the United States uh, for uh, on, on allegations of violations of U.S. sanctions uh, against Iran. They didn't do anything wrong. Some of them, all of them have contested these allegations. Most of them have not been uh, convicted. convicted. Most of them are just charged with this. It's interesting that people living in Malaysia uh, were uh, put on red alert notice by the United States for having violated or being accused of violating terms of US sanctions, not on US soil, but in Malaysia. One of them died in prison in the Philippines. Now, all of them are back in Iran, but they are on red alert notices from the United States. So humanitarian cases are not just humanitarian cases of concern to the United States. There are humanitarian cases of concern to Iran. I'm not talking about the quid pro quo or a swap, but I'm talking about mutual confidence building measures that we need to adopt. And there are discussions that hopefully will lead to a serious outcome uh, resolving these cases because all of us want to uh, resolve these cases. Of course, unfortunately, the individuals uh, who are Iranian-American uh, and who are in jail in Iran uh, have been convicted of serious crimes. But uh, I think there is no point in, in continuing uh, uh, an unnecessary situation where we can find a humanitarian way to resolve this. And I'm doing my best to, in order to assist, of course, our judiciary is, is independent. Uh, we can try to help. We have tried to help, and we will continue to try to help in order to address this problem. And I hope uh, that with goodwill and uh, good faith, we can resolve it. Great. I'm going to open the aperture a little and talk more broadly about this agreement in, a broader, in, a, in another context, and that is to me, this agreement is extremely important in terms of over overcoming this uh, nuclear, uh, these nuclear concerns. But I think it is equally vital that at a time of so many problems in the region, uh, we need to see Iran as playing a big role in trying to overcome these problems. You know, I, uh, I lived in Iraq. And I must say, for many Americans, when they hear Shia and they hear Sunni, they think Sunni is State University of New York. They're not sure uh, what the problem is. But uh, I don't think it's just Shia Sunni. I think there are a lot of other things within the Sunni community, maybe within the Shia community. But it seems that we live in troubled times. Uh, whether it's something in the water, it's hard to say. Sometimes these issues are cyclical, go back in Saudi Arabian history, you see some of these issues coming up in different centuries, but I'm kind of worried about where things are going, and I wonder if you can comment on it from your country's perspective of what can be done to kind of calm this region down, what needs to be kind of the approach. Well, uh, as I said, a paradigm shift is required, and it, it should start with all of us recognizing that the problems that are, taking, that are appearing in our region are problems that will affect all of us, that nobody will be immune. We cannot have uh, extremism confined to one country. Some of our neighbors believe that extremists and the Syrian army could kill each other off in Syria. They wake, woke up to, be, to see how wrong they were. Now we, we have all, all these extremists attracting followers from all over the world. Uh, they, I mean, uh, in, in one day, there was 
a uh, bombing of a Shia mosque in, in Kuwait, a bombing of a tourist resort in Tunisia, and a bombing of a factory in France. Three incidents involving three different targets carried out by a single group in one day. That tells you that the victims and the regions are not confined to one group or one geography. It goes beyond our region, it goes beyond the geography of Syria or Iraq, and the sooner we realize that this is a common threat, the sooner that we can address it. That, that is the paradigm shift that I said is required, that we all need to see this as a threat. Some of our friends in the region saw this as an opportunity. Unfortunately, they, some continue to see this as an opportunity. They believe this can unseat a, a government. They believe this can redress the disequilibrium that they think was created after the fall of Saddam Hussein and after what they call the Arab Spring or we call Islamic awakening. Uh, no matter what we call it, it, it didn't turn out to be something uh, extremely positive in, in our region. So uh, it, this is the problem. The problem is we need to look at this issue differently. And I believe once we see extremism and terrorism and violence and the underlying causes of these, you know that uh, the, the, the group we, we now call ISIS or Daesh or whatever uh, was the, the outcome in its origin of US invasion of Iraq. Uh, these are the sons and daughters of Abu Musab Zarqawi. And Zarqawi gained uh, a footing, a foothold in the region after the US invasion of Iraq as was the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, who grew out of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. You always have internal causes. You cannot just look uh, at the outside forces and outside causes as the only cause. You have dictatorship, you have uh, repression, all of that. You have no uh, avenue for uh, expression of frustration domestically, but you also have external elements that lead to this. So I, I think what is, what is taking place in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, in our region in general, requires a common approach by all of us. We have been ready to deal with that through that paradigm, uh, because we believe that although our population for the time being is immune, from this because they're not vulnerable to the type of message. Iran is overwhelmingly Shia, and uh, our population is not vulnerable to an anti-Shia uh, message that is being propagated by ISIS and Daesh. But unfortunately, the population in some of our neighbors who have either turned a blind eye to Daesh or have actively supported it in the past, their population is sympathetic, at least. So among Sunni populations, there is some sympathy for these extreme Sunni groups, is what you're saying. Yeah. Not all Sunni populations, right. but, uh, but some yeah. who belong to the Salafi Wahhabi yeah. uh, 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 inclinations in the, in the Sunni world, which would be predominantly Saudi Arabia and some of the Persian right. Gulf countries. Right. Right. So they are more vulnerable. And the sooner they realize that this extremist group is not even a temporary asset. It's going to be a temporary and long-term liability threat. Unless they see it, because once they see, as long as they see this as a zero-sum game, that anything that undermines Iran or its allies in the region is necessarily uh, their uh, gain in the region, as long as they change that mentality, they will not be able to deal seriously with this threat. We are prepared to see a threat against them and against us as a joint threat and deal with it in a joint manner. So you would regard radical Sunniism as a threat to moderate Sunniism as well as a threat to you? Yes. And a threat to us, for that it's matter. It's a threat to everybody in yeah. the world. And it, 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 it is something that cannot be addressed only through military means. It may require certain military action, but more importantly, it requires serious cultural, political, ideological, economic, uh, and uh, other measures. Now, let, me, let me 
address a few of them. You see people beheading innocent civilians in Iraq and Syria. You listen to them, they speak with a perfect French or English accent. They were born and raised in France or in the United Kingdom. Why is it? Because the feeling of alienation, the feeling of disenfranchisement is so severe in some of these societies, these people are not the products of ideological upbringing. <coughs> they were educated in the West. But the alienation, the Islamophobia, the feeling of suppression and humiliation is so pervasive that pushes them to commit these atrocities that cannot be forgiven or even justified. But you have to understand it. There are economic reasons, economic motivations as well as economic reasons. You see, not only people who join these groups are attracted by the economic down, uh, I mean, uh, economic dividends of joining these groups, but the fact is that these groups are selling their oil. Who's buying their oil? Who's buying the oil that is produced by Daesh? Who's paying for it? Da Which, Daesh being ISIS. ISIS. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who's paying for it? Which bank does the transaction? Because Iran's oil was uh, embargoed by the United States, even if we sold a single barrel more than the, our quota, both the people who bought it as well as the bank who carried the transaction were fined by the United States. Now, who's buying the oil from ISIS? Who's paying it? Which bank is, is doing the transaction? So this is not just law and order, military. It's also financial. I mean, every month, a thousand people enter Syria and Iraq. A thousand new people. This, is, this has become a revolving door. Uh, extremists attract new followers, new recruits, come from 82 countries, go to Iraq and Syria. They get trained. If they don't die, after a while they go back to their own societies, become the focus of new extremist movements. So we've got to look at this from that perspective and see that we need a combined, global, comprehensive effort to deal with this. Just aerial bombardments will not do the job as they haven't done in the past one year. Let's look at Syria, because I think we've been essentially talking about Syria without mentioning Syria. It seems it needs some political arrangements forward. But if you have elections in the current context, don't Sunnis just vote for Sunnis and Alawites vote for Alawites and Kurds vote for Kurds? I mean, you get a census out of an election, but I don't think you get political uh, consensus. Well, uh, I, I think what is necessary in Syria is to have, a, again, a comprehensive strategy. Comprehensive strategy is to have political reform in Syria, to end the fightings, even localized ceasefires may work, to end the fighting as, as much as you can. Because to stop the fighting. So. You can't stop the fighting because there are areas where Daesh, where ISIS, and other terrorist organizations of, of different colors are, are operating. But there are areas where people who can be brought into a political process are fighting each other. So you have to stop those fightings. I mean, it's impossible to stop the fighting with ISIS. Then everybody should join forces in order to deal with ISIS, including uh, others from outside, uh, Iran, uh, Russia, uh, regional countries, the, United, the coalition, if they, if they so wish, uh, so that they could engage. At the same time, we need a political process. That is, now Syria has a centralized power structure all in one man. And that is why the fate of that individual has become the only issue that has prevented a political solution, President Assad. What we can do is to make sure that in Syria we have a political system that is not centralized, power is dispersed, there are various institutions of government, you insist on those elements instead of on individuals. You insist on guarantees instead of saying whether President Assad should run in an election or not run in an, in an election. You should insist that there should be a free and fair election. So who insists? You mean countries come unfortunately, together? Yeah. Unfortunately, the United States, Saudi Arabia, 
Turkey and European, uh, some European countries have always insisted, up until a few months ago, they were insisting that President Assad should just go before the political process starts. Now they're insisting that, of course, President Assad can stay because they know that if, if he, he goes, he, the only replacement will be ISIS and, and the terrorists. So they have come to this understanding that it is impossible to ask him to go right now without opening the door, I mean, giving Damascus to ISIS in a platter. So they say he can be a part of the process provided that he participates in digging his own grave. Uh, in digging uh, his own grave. I mean, that, that, that's, that's essentially what they're saying. I mean, people should think about what they're saying. You, they say he can be a part of the process provided that he ensures that he's not involved in the, in the outcome. I think that is uh, putting your emphasis on the wrong uh, aspect of this deal. What you need to do is to, to put emphasis on the process itself, that the process should be fair that there should be various offices in the future of the Syrian government, that there should be serious elections, and then allow the Syrian people to decide. Enable the Syrian people to decide. We in the outside world should facilitate the outcome, not dictate the outcome. No negotiations can lead to any conclusion if you want to conclude before negotiations. I mean, that, that's not the name of the game. You've, been, you, you've negotiated for, for all your life. You know that you cannot say before you enter the room that I want this outcome and ask the other side to accept your outcome. You can have your, yeah. your own desire about what, the out, what outcome you want to have, but you cannot ask the other side before entering the negotiations to accept the outcome that you want. So this, I, I think, negotiations without precondition, a national unity government in Syria is the answer. It can happen provided that outsiders, because Syrians have, not, have never been given a voice. Syrians have never been allowed to, to elect. There was a presidential election, but all the Syrians, the six million Syrians who were outside Syria, were prevented from voting. Where they were allowed to vote, they voted for President Assad. In Lebanon, they were allowed to vote, and I understand there were no intimidation in Lebanon, and there were four candidates, three of them Sunni, and they voted for President Assad, overwhelmingly. But, but I'm not saying that's the outcome. I'm saying you should allow the outcome to take shape in the hands and by the decision of the Syrian people and not by outsiders. By the way, at the Dayton Peace Accords, we, we negotiated the territory, constitution, elections, supervision of elections. We negotiated a peace-keeping uh, force. And at the end of all that, we said, by the way, we don't want indicted war criminals to be part of this process. And it was accepted by all. Well, uh, you, ha you had a different case in, in, uh, in, the, in the Balkans. Uh, here you have a different case. You have a situation where a president says, I'm the only force who uh, sacrificed everything in order to prevent ISIS from taking over Damascus. Mm -hmm. that, that's the difference you have here. Mm -hmm. And a whole lot of Syrians believe him. Yeah. How, how are you, the biggest development in the last week was of course the Russian move to actually put troops on the ground, set up air bases, and begin air operations. Um, did this come as a surprise to you? Well, uh, you see, uh, a, a year ago, the United States decided to conduct air operations in Syria without the consent of the government of Syria, which is still represented in the United Nations. That is, for all practical purposes, it is the gov recognized government of Syria. And nobody said that something extraordinary had happened. Everybody was asking, why is the United States not serious enough in fighting the ISIS? Not that why it is involved. Now, another government, I mean, for all practical purposes, US and Russia are two members of the Security Council. There is nothing in the charter that gives one privilege over another. Uh, I mean, with all due respect to all of you Americans. <laughs> 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 in, in our view, nothing gives privilege to any, I mean, either Russia or the United States. But at least if, if you consider yourself a permanent member of the Security Council, I think they have an equal uh, share of the blame or responsibility for being permanent member of the Security Council. 
So the difference is they are there upon the invitation of the government, which has a seat in the United Nations. So if I want to compare the two, I guess legally, at least the United States cannot blame Russia for being there. And now we see the coalition saying, why is Russia there? Why are you there? I mean, is, is anybody asking that question? Who gave you the right to be there? I mean, you have a number of paid opposition sitting in, in luxury hotels in Istanbul and in Doha. This is the moderate Serbian uh, uh, Whatever moderate you want to call them, yeah. moderate Syrian opposition, I call them paid hotel opposition because <laughs> all they do is sit in hotels and spend your money, which is fine. I mean, they're not spending my money. Uh, I mean, uh, but, 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 but that, that's what they are. They have asked you to be there. Did the people of Syria ask you to be there? Did the government of Syria ask the United States and the international coalition to be there? And even setting that aside, what has the United States and international coalition done in Iraq or Syria against ISIS? I mean, there's been a year of, bombard, I mean, of, of coalition effort. And the reason for that is, and I tell you what the reason is, not that the United States is incapable of doing it, but because the United States has inhibitions, has restraints. And what are those restraints? Your allies in the region do not want to undermine ISIS because it will strengthen the central government. And because of that, the United States and all of that coalition air power that exists in, in Syria cannot go all the way against ISIS because it would amount to strengthening the central government in, in Damascus. And for the same reason, they are not successful in Iraq. I mean, in Iraq, you know Ambassador Hill Iraq better than I do. Uh, the, the militia in Iraq has been much more successful in liberating Iraqi territory from ISIS than the U.S. coalition. Why is that? The, the reason for that is the U.S. coalition, first of all, you cannot fight terrorists from, by aerial bombardment. You need to, to have a serious ground operation. Secondly, because in my view, the United States is not capable of fighting ISIS because of the concerns that its allies in the region have over this attempt ending up strengthening governments that they find unacceptable. And because everything is seen in that zero-sum mentality and paradigm, uh, it's, it has not been possible to have a serious fight with ISIS. This is not my statement. If you look at what the United States is saying, the United States is saying, let's agree on a political solution without Assad, and we will get rid of ISIS in no time. That means that there is a political precondition for the international coalition to have a serious fight against ISIS. I believe that is short-sighted. I, I believe that is misplaced. I believe Daesh, ISIS is a threat against all of us. It's not an asset. We have to remember, ISIS is not an asset for anybody. It's a liability. And it's a deadly liability. And it's a deadly liability more for the countries that are supporting it or have supported it in the past than for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. You presumably have some contacts with the Saudis. Presumably you've been able to have some discussions about this, but no mutual understanding on these issues? Unfortunately, our Saudi neighbors are not prepared to discuss these issues with us. I see. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the recent tragedy in Saudi Arabia has further strained our relations uh, because of the way our uh, victims were treated. Now, whatever uh, caused this mishap, which is huge. I mean, thousands of people died, and they shouldn't have. But uh, for us, uh, similar to your cultural uh, 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 inclinations, return of the bodies is important. Proper so, burial. So this was the stampede that stampede, took place during the Hajj. 464 Iranians were killed. 464 464. Uh, yeah. oh, several thousand were killed altogether. And we insisted 
that, okay, whatever led to this stampede, we, we can investigate later, and we need to investigate later because we want to prevent it next year. But let's have our, let's identify our bodies and give us back the bodies because we want to give them to their families for proper burial. Some of the families refuse to leave Saudi Arabia because they say we won't leave without the bodies of our loved ones. For, for our Saudi friends, this is a cultural difference. They just get rid of the bodies. I mean, uh, no, 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 really, this, is not, this does not mean disrespect to them. That, that's their cultural tradition. They do, not, they do not believe. I mean, the way they dealt with King Abdullah's body. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a, a very simple ceremony. They just put it there and yeah. end, how, end how of the story. In, yeah. in our case, we need proper burial. We, I mean, our war with Iraq ended somewhat uh, 1988. What is that? 20, what, 20... 25 years ago. No, no, 27 years ago. Years ago yeah. 20, we still, I mean, our search teams still get killed or maimed in order to find pieces of their bodies for proper burial. That's how important bodies of our loved ones are to us. Does that have to do with the culture or religion? I mean, is that something... That... I mean, uh, Saudi brand of, it, of Wahhabi Islam believes that it is uh, blasphemy to uh, be concerned with bodies and with, with, with dead, totally. Uh, and that is why for them going to the shrines is, is not something that is very welcome. I see, I see. So that, that, that's a, yeah. I mean, it's a new interpretation of Islam, which is only a few centuries old, and, and it has aligned itself with, the, with, with Saudi monarchy. Uh, the Wahhabi school of thought and Saudi monarchy, but that's the interpretation of Islam that can uh, that has unfortunately given rise to the extremist ideologies that we see in the region. That that is that is what has woven this together. The, this this interpretation of Islam, which is prone, unfortunately, has been prone to misinterpretation. Has nothing to do with Islam, nothing to do with any uh, Islamic school of thought, but has unfortunately been misinterpreted in order to justify this demagoguery that is taking place. So in how were these remains returned then to Tehran? Well, we have been able to identify 300 and something after a very long delay because this has taken place now 10 days ago. Uh, and now we were able to return 300 and some bodies and we are still missing over 100. I see. And, I see. and this, this is a huge thing in Iran. You won't believe how huge it is in Iran. I'm, I'm blamed for staying in the United States and not going to the region in order to get the bodies back home. I see. I see. Okay. Mr. Minister, I, I promised to get you out by four and uh, by uh, Denver time, we still have a lot more time. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I, I really think I, I should let you go to your many appointments. But I, I do have some gifts I'd like to give you from the university. Oh. And uh, they're all very small gifts, and they're all extremely practical. So if you'll wait right there, I, I think I have them here. Well, most of them. All right. Wow. So uh, here we go. Uh, let me see. I'll, we'll do this standing up. Okay. All right. Here is a, a pen that says University of Denver. You can use that to write notes to John Kerry. Uh, we, we, we write uh, yeah. <laughs> This is a, uh, a little uh, that thing. That was him. Give me a computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. That's for the Chinese. We'll do that. Uh, this is a little thing for your business cards. Thank you. Um, this is a, uh, a globe where, wow. you, where you look at. It has your name on it, I think, and you can put it on your, um, on your desk oh, there. Gosh. Thank you. And on the back side says the Corbell School. Oh, gorgeous. Thank you. And then um, this is. Um, That's great. Thanks. This is something to put your glass of orange juice on your desk. Uh, it's, it's a coaster. And then uh, I have one other gift, which is, um, you may not have heard that um, the oh, University yes, of have. Denver, <laughs> you know, up until 2015, every school that won the lacrosse championship of the United States was on the Atlantic coast. So for the first time, a school on the Platte River coast won. And so this is a lacrosse helmet, so maybe you can wear this when you meet John Kerry again. So there you go. <laughs>
I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Minister, we are very proud of you from the University of Denver. And Thank as you. soon as you are able to go further than New Jersey, I do hope that you will come see, to, see us. I think you, I don't know if you can see it there, but that is a new building here. I'm going to show this to you. This is, our, this is going to be our new building. We've okay. just put the top on. Okay. So uh, there's the Evans Chapel. And then if you just maybe go to the other side here, excuse me, we didn't quite choreograph this. Um, you will see that there is the school where you got your PhD. Uh -huh. And imagine if you could have gotten your PhD in this new building. Yeah. I mean, imagine what you could have become. So. Uh, <laughs> So, once again, Mr. Minister, very honored to have Thank you. you. I think everyone has had Thank a you. great time with you. So, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. So, we will. This is great.